Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Good. Um, it is uh, 5.40, I believe, uh, and a time when most young men's thoughts turn towards beer, so I appreciate you actually coming here instead. And if you decide that you'd rather go get beer, I won't blame you at all, although we might go get some later. Who can... Um, Tell me what's on the cover of this book. It is a nebula. Which nebula? It is the Crab Nebula. Excellent. What is the Crab Nebula? Leftovers, leftovers from? It is leftovers, yes. From? A supernova. What year was that? Kevlin 1054 AD. Excellent. 1054 A.D., there was an explosion in the sky which left this by, uh, right by the uh, left horn in the bull of Taurus. Uh, and what is at the center of it? No. No, it is not God. Uh, a neutron star, that is correct. It is a neutron star. And, and uh, uh, what kind of neutron star is it? I'm going to drop the John Cleese. Or, excuse me, that wasn't John Cleese. That was Kevin Haney. Uh, <laughs> what kind of pulse... Excuse me. What kind of neutron star is it? A pulsar, which is... a rotating neutron star. But why does it pulse? Yes, it's rotating. Good, fine. But why does it pulse? Why do we call it a pulsar? Where do the pulses come from? Yes, there's all kinds of photons coming out of two ends of it, and they sweep around the sky, but why? Why do they do this? Magnetism. The little neutron star carries with it the entire magnetic field of its parent star, which is now spinning, in the case of this particular pulsar, at 30 times a second. I'd like you to imagine something with one and a half solar masses, 10 miles in diameter, spinning 30 times per second, carrying a stellar magnetic field. It's going to be generating some power. And that power accelerates photons, and those photons collide with us, and what we see is something blinking away in the sky. I did this because the people at the bookstore said, you've got to promote your book because we ordered too damn many of them, so I'm promoting my book. You should go buy it. I won't be offended if you buy it. Go buy it at the bookstore, and then if you stop me later, I'm perfectly happy to sign it even more than once. No, I'm not giving that one away, but I may throw it at someone if they're a little too loud. So, I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about the transformation priority premise, which is this bizarre idea I had a while ago. Uh, how many of you are um, test-driven developers? Oh, boy. Okay, so we got a lot of you in the room, which is quite a bit different from the last time I asked this question this morning, where only about a third of you were. So let me ask it a different way. How many of you are not test-driven developers? Ah, this, this, we've got an interesting priority inversion here. Only about a third of you are not. Of course, this is a self-selected audience. You came to hear about test-driven development, of course, because the transformation priority premise is all about test-driven development. What is test-driven development? Those of you who say you are test-driven developers, let's see if you really are. Test-driven development is a discipline, something we follow when we're writing code. And it's composed of a few laws. And the first law is that you are not allowed to write any production code until you have first written a unit test that fails. Most programmers resist this at first sight. They think it's fundamentally stupid because it is. Uh, they think it is a, a nonsense idea. Why would you write your unit test first? Why wouldn't you write your code first and then test it? And in fact, most people who say that they are doing test-driven development, in fact, do it in reverse. They don't do TDD. They do DDT. They make sure that they write their tests last. That is not test-driven development. In test-driven development, you write your tests first. There's a reason we write our tests first, but I'll get to that a little bit later. 
The second law of test-driven development is even worse than the first. It says that you are not allowed to write more of a unit test than is sufficient to fail. And not compiling is failing, which means you cannot write a complete unit test. Because you're going to mention the name of something that you have not written yet, and that will force it to not compile, and you will not be able to complete the unit test. You'll have to start writing production code. But then the third law kicks in, and the third law says you are not allowed to write more production code than is sufficient to pass the currently failing test. These three laws conspire to lock you into a loop that is perhaps 20 seconds long. You will write a little test code, but then it won't compile, so you'll write a little production code to make it compile, but then you'll have to write some more test code, and it will fail, and you'll have to write some more production code to make it pass, and you'll be going around this dumb little loop every 20 seconds, and it will feel stupid! And you will feel stupid for doing it. No, no programmer of any reasonable amount of experience would look at that and think it's a good thing to do. It feels dumb. But imagine a group of people doing this, exactly what I described, this stupid thing. Pick one of them. doesn't matter who. doesn't matter when. Sometime in the last 30 seconds, everything they were working on executed and passed all its tests. And it doesn't matter who you pick, and it doesn't matter when you pick them. Everything was working 30 seconds ago. What would your life be like, those of you who don't experience this, if everything was working 30 seconds ago? Some of you are reacting, saying, well, that's just impossible. No, it's not. Well, you can't get around the build loop that, that fast. Yes, you can. Consider it a design challenge. It is a design challenge for you to be able to get around the build loop that, time, that fast. What would you do to your source code? What would you do to the structure of your application if it were a firm requirement that you had to get around that build loop once every 30 seconds? Could you do it? The answer is yes, you could. How much debugging do you think you would do? if it all worked 30 seconds ago. How many of you are really good at the debugger? How many of you have trained your fingers to know exactly when to do a step into and a step over? You've got all the hot keys in your mind. The debugger is part of your body. This is not a skill to be desired. You don't want to be good at the debugger. If you are good at the debugger, it means you spend a lot of time debugging. And I don't want you spending time debugging. I want you spending time writing code that works. If I could tell you that you could eliminate half of your debugging time by following these three stupid laws, would that make a difference to you? It might. But it is not the reason we do test-driven development. The reason we do test-driven development is actually very simple. Pardon me. I lost my history. There it is. Ah, that's because it was already there. Lovely. How many of you have looked at a piece of code on your screen and your first thought is, my God, this is a mess. Someone needs to clean it. And your second thought is, it's not going to be me. I'm not going to be the one to clean this code because I know if I clean it, I might break it. And if I break it, it will become mine. So you walk away from the code. You will not touch the code. This is why code rots. How many of you work in a, an environment where the code has rotted? This is why the code has rotted. Everyone is afraid to clean it. I don't have time to clean it. It might break. I'll have to debug it. I don't know what I'll do. Other things might break. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Code rots because we don't clean it. Why don't we clean it? Because we're afraid of it. Why are we afraid of it? We are afraid of it because we cannot do what I'm about to do.
No, I did it wrong, of course. Did the wrong one. Pardon me a moment while I do the right one. Here it is. Little green button. There we go. What you're looking at now is a, an application I've been working on for the last 10 years or so. It's uh, got about uh, 75,000 lines of Java code. It's a web-based system with a big, thick middleware and a nice back-end data store. I'm running all of the tests. Those tests should complete in just under a minute, maybe just over a minute. The uh, amount of code coverage is on the order of 90% as measured by uh, various code coverage tools. Those code coverage tools cannot see some of the code executing because it's executed out of process. So I believe that the code coverage is on the order of 95%. When this test finishes, which it should shortly, and I hope it passes, then I know this code works. How certain am I that this code works? You're looking at the QA process. If this turns green, I ship it. I have no other thing that I do. There's one other test suite of tests that I run, which takes another 30 seconds. If those two suites of tests run, I ship this code. Uh, nobody dies if there's a bug. It's an open source project. You know, no, nobody loses millions of dollars, as far as I know. On the other hand, I have tens of thousands of users, and I have a bug list that would fit on an index card. How many of you have got a bug list that's longer than an index card? Think about what that means. A bug list that is long means that you have screwed up. You have allowed a bug list to accumulate. You have been irresponsible. You have allowed bugs and defects to accumulate in your code. How could you have done this? What should um, QA find? Nothing. Why do QA departments exist? Because we screwed up. And our company has decided they, they needed to form a whole different department to defend themselves against us. We screwed up. We continued to screw up. And our company said, well, cripe, somebody's got to check this code. Can't be the programmers. Apparently, they don't know how to do it. And so we create some department of people whose job it is to clean up the mess after the programmers. Shame on us for allowing this to happen. That was a very unprofessional thing for us to have done for the last 40 years. Look at that test. It's passed. I now know that that code works. What if I want to clean a part of it? I could pull up a bit of this code, and I could make a small change, and then if I were worried about it failing, I could just click that button and know that I could ship it. Oh, I could make a couple of cleanups. I could clean it up, push the button, it would run. I push the, do another little cleanup, push the button, it would run. I would not be afraid to clean it. And because I'm not afraid to clean it, it does not rot. How many of you have been significantly slowed down by bad code? Within the last two days. Okay, week. Uh. Why would we allow the bad code to persist? We know that it slows us down. We know that it impedes us. We know that the bad code is going to have a horrible effect on our schedules. We know it. We feel it. But we allow it. Why do we allow it? Because we're afraid to fix it. We're afraid to touch it. You have a suite of tests like that, you are no longer afraid. That fear goes away. Suddenly, you can clean the code. We talk a lot about design and architecture. How many of you have been to a talk at this conference about design and architecture so far? No, Kevlin's talk did not count. That was, that was a fluid talk on something else. Right? <laughs> so why do we think about design and architecture? What's so important about it? Why do we put so much weight on proper design and good architecture? Thank you. We want to be able to change our decisions. We want to be able to change our code. We want our code to be flexible and maintainable. And a good, solid architecture does that. It makes our code flexible and maintainable. But nothing makes code more flexible than a suite of tests by a huge order of magnitude. 
If you have a suite of tests, you are not afraid to change it. If I give you a perfectly designed system, perfectly designed system with no tests, you will be afraid to change it and it will rot. If I give you a terribly designed system with a complete suite of tests that executes in a minute or two, you will not be afraid to clean it and it will unrot. The code will improve. This is the reason we do test-driven development. That is the prime me mechanism by which test-driven development works. But it depends upon something critically. You must trust your life to that suite of tests. That suite of tests is a parachute, and you are going to jump out of an airplane with it, and so you must trust it. You must know that it is folded correctly and packed correctly. It must be a clean suite of tests. It must be a complete suite of tests. It cannot be something that you threw together after the fact. This is why we write the tests first. Because when you write the test second, your heart is not in it, frankly. You already know that the code works because you've tested it manually. And now you are going to write a bunch of unit tests because somebody said you should. And all right, I'll write a few damn tests and maybe I'll cover this and maybe I'll cover that. But that thing in there is too hard to test and I know it works already so I'm not testing it. And then when it comes to jumping out of the airplane, you think, wait. Uh, I'm not sure I trust these tests. I better not clean that code. I better not fix that design, because I'm not sure those tests really cover everything. And you have lost the entire benefit. How many of you have integrated a third-party package? And you get the documentation from the third party, and you, you read through it, and you get this nice manual. And the manual is a clever little thing written by some, some uh, tech writer. And at the back of the manual, there's this ugly section where all the code examples are. Where do you go? You go to the code examples. You don't want to read what the tech writer wrote. You want to look at the code, because the code will tell you the truth. What we are writing when we write these little unit tests are the code examples for the whole system. You want to know how to create uh, an object? There is a test that creates that object every way it can be created. You want to know how to call some API function? There is a test that calls that API function every way it can be called. Here's a bunch of tests. I've got them on the screen. They're generally small little things, a few lines of code. That one happens to be a little larger than usual. Each one of them is a description of how some part of the system works. A description written in a language you understand, so formal it executes, and it cannot get out of sync with the application. It is the perfect kind of documentation. You want to know how anything works inside this code, you can look at the unit tests and get a nice little short understanding of what's going on inside, how to call the functions, what to pass in, what exceptions you expect to get out, Everything is nicely documented because you have tested it all. And if that weren't enough, just, just to put a little bit of icing on the cake. If you have written all your tests first, like this, if you have followed these three laws, then every line of code you have written sits in a testable module. One of the fluid principles was unit testable. It must be unit testable, but there's another word for testable. That word is decoupled. The only way to test something is to decouple it, to get it so that its interfaces are exposed, so you can reach into its guts and test it. Therefore, if you follow these dumb three laws, you will improve the design of your system rather dramatically because you must decouple everything. That's why we do test-driven development. Now, how many of you are doing test-driven development? Well, this is a slightly different number than I saw before. Good. Maybe you've learned something today. Right? Test-driven development is a discipline. It is not the mere act of writing tests every once in a while. It is a discipline that we follow, and it has specific benefits. If you do not trust that test suite with your life, you are not doing test-driven development. Now, that's not what this talk is about. I just thought I'd stretch the hour a bit so that I could dump that on you. 
What is this talk really about? Well, this, this talk is about something that I discovered over the last uh, eight years or so. And it started one day at my kitchen table. My son, who was at the time a young adolescent, came home and said, Dad, I've got some homework to do. I need to uh, figure out the prime factors of a bunch of integers. And he showed me the homework, and there it was on this page of his math book. Had a bunch of integers with a question saying, please write the prime factors of the integers. So I said to him, look, Justin, you go do your homework. Come back to me with the, uh, the homework all written out. And by the time you get back, I will have written a program that will allow us to check to see if you're correct. I wasn't going to do the homework for him. But I was going to write a program that allowed him to check it. And so while he went away, I did what I'm about to do for you. This is the prime factors kata. Who's seen it before? A few of you. Good. Well, you're going to see it again in Java, but I'm going to comment all, every time I go through it. I begin all such programs with a unit test. This unit test, excuse me, I wrote that in the wrong, prime factors test. This unit test starts out with a nothing method that executes because I begin everything with an executing platform. You see the green bar? That means I am already executing. I'm going to el er eliminate that. What I need to do is write a, a set of unit tests and the code associated with it that will compute prime factors. I'm going to do it this way. Uh, let's see. I'll write a test function. Uh, that test function is going to be um, named factors, or maybe better yet, uh, prime factors. Lovely. And uh, let's see. I'm going to say uh, assert equals that. As list, oh no, 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 that should be arrays dot as list. This is a function inside of Java that will take a list of integers and turn it into an array. Uh, should be prime factors dot of uh, one. Oh, now I need to do all this interesting work, so hang on just a minute while I bring in the arrays, and then I'm going to say that should be prime factors, not prime factors test. I'm going to Im create the class prime factors, if I can hit my keys properly. Good. Good. Yep, there it is. There's the class prime factors. Notice that I had to stop writing the unit test because everything didn't compile. Uh, there's my method of good. It's going to return a list of integers. Uh, let's see, n. Mm -hmm, that's good. Oop, I need to bring in the list package. Fine. Good. Yes, good. All right. Hmm. Oh, the assert function. Mm -hmm. Writing Java is this interesting exploration of all the import libraries. Uh, those of you who work in Rails have lost this fun little exploration. But uh, those of us who use enterprisey kind of languages uh, still do it to our misfortune. Uh, lovely. I'm going to do a few uh, static imports here. Yes, there's that one. And I'll do that static import to get my unit test down to something very small. The prime factors of 1 is the empty list. Number 1 does not have any prime factors. I'm going to uh, test this, run this test. And what I will get, of course, is an error because the code is returning null. But I will transform that null. Notice the use of the word. I will continue using this word. I'm going to transform that null into a, an empty list. I use an array list because that is the concrete class, whereas list is the abstract class. And now, the test passes. If all I had to do is compute the prime factors of 1, I would be done now. But let's do a more uh, competent algorithm. The next test, hmm, let's see. As list uh, 2 is the prime factors of 2. 
The number two has one prime factor itself. This test will fail, of course, but I can make it pass. And I can make it pass by doing what? Well, somehow I'm going to have to put a two into this list. So, well, I could return two, but then that would fail the first test, which has to return an empty list. So I have to be somewhat intelligent. I'm going to take this new array list. I'm going to transform it into a variable named factors. And I'm going to insert an if statement. If n is greater than 1, then uh, factors.add 2. Will this pass or fail? A bunch of programmers in the room ought to be able to figure that much out. Yes, it passes. Lovely. So off to the next test. The next test as list three of three. This should fail, of course. And it does. It fails. How do we make this pass? And this is the first time I felt a chill as I sat at my kitchen table. And I, contemplating, I contemplated how to get this test to pass. And I realized I could get it to pass by changing one character. And that put a chill down my spine. I realized that something significant had happened. I wasn't quite sure what it was. But I can make this pass by taking something specific, like 2, and turning it into something generic, like n. That should pass. It does. And here we get the first hint about a, a hidden rule inside of test-driven development. As you write tests, you are adding constraints to the problem. Every new test adds a new constraint, a new thing that you have to get past, a new, a new um, uh, constraint. But I could make this pass by putting a set of if statements in the production code. If 1, then return nothing. If 2, then return 2. If 3, then return 3. If 4, then return 2 and 2. I could do that. But obviously, that would defeat the purpose. So what is the rule that prevents us in test-driven development from being that stupid? And the rule is this. As the tests get more specific, the code must get more generic. Every motion we make to the production code must be a motion in the general direction. Everything we do to that production code must somehow make it more general than it was before. Even as the tests are getting more specific than they were before, the production code becomes more generic or more general. This is interesting. This is a motion in opposite directions, and it's the only way to get test-driven development to work. Otherwise, you wind up with this silly code that just mirrors the tests. But what is the next test case? Uh, as list, well, it's going to be a 4, and the prime factors of 4 are 2 and 2. This will fail, of course. How do I get this to pass? There is no clever way to make this pass. There's no single character I can change. I'm going to have to rely upon brute force. And the rules of test-driven development are painfully clear in this case. You must do the simplest thing that could work. Now, you can't violate the general rule. It's got to be more general. But you also have to do the simplest thing that could work. And unfortunately, the simplest thing that could work here is a real mess. Watch what I've got to do to make this work. I've got to put in another if statement. That if statement is going to be something like, uh, if n is divisible by 2, then, oh heavens, another if statement, um, factors dot add 2. And now I need to change n. Since I have proven that n is divisible by 2, I need to reduce n by that factor. I'll fall through, and the result will be a 2 in the case of 4. And it will add the second two to the list. This should pass. 
Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, it passes the 4 case well enough, but it doesn't pass the 2 case because that when I put a 2 in there, it divides it by 2, leaving a 1, which I then happily put into the list. That's not good, so now I must do even more horrible hacking if n is greater than 1. And now this should pass. My god, I've hacked my way to hell. This is awful. This is terrible, yucky, horrible code. And, and then in the next test case, I'm just going to have to throw it all away because something in here is going to force me to come up with the real algorithm. And this certainly isn't it. Although this code has some interesting fa features. Um, this if statement is the same as that if statement, which is odd. I'm testing the same thing twice. Now, we do test the same thing twice when it's a loop. In a loop, of course, we test the same thing many times, not just twice, many times. It's as though we had a series of if statements. It's just that we loop around. This almost looks like some kind of degenerate loop where the second if statement is the next iteration and the final iteration through a loop. In fact, I might be able to do something as clever as taking that if statement and moving it down outside of the first one so that it truly looks like it's part of another loop. And that seems to work. I like the regularity of that. And a lot of coding, by the way, is just making things look regular and consistent. So I kind of like that. I'm going to leave it like this. And I'm going to go back to my tests and now I'm going to do this. Uh, five. Will this pass or fail? I think it will pass. It does. Lovely. Well, uh, six. Six is more complicated. Uh, as list two and three are the factors of six. Pass or fail? Pass. Okay. Uh, let's try the next one uh, as list seven. Pass. Uh, I've just gotten three passes in a row. This algorithm seems to be working. There's no way it can work for eight. It just can't work for eight because nothing in this code will put more than two things in the list. And the prime factors of eight are two, two, and two. So I'm sure it's wrong for the eight case, but it is startling that it worked for five, six, and seven without change. This algorithm that I thought was so hacky seems to be doing a fairly good job, but the next test case will break it. This will fail, of course. It returns a two and a four instead of the three twos I'd like. And so now I'm going to have to do something intelligent. I'm going to have to go back here and write the real algorithm. Or is there something I can do here to somehow make this pass? Repeatedly divide by two. You mean that if statement. I could turn into a while loop. That was the second time that chills went down my spine as I sat at the kitchen table. And I took an if statement and I turned it into a while loop and realized that that if statement I had written has not, was not in fact a hack. It was just a degenerate form of what really belonged there. That the code that I had kind of hacked into place was not, in fact, a hack. It was just not quite general enough. And I could make it general by the simplest of transformations, transforming an if statement into a while loop, which is an interesting transformation because an if statement is a degenerate form of a while loop. A while loop is a general form of an if statement. 
I wonder if that will happen again. Nine. This will certainly fail because nothing we do divides by three. So we've got no, not even a concept of three in the algorithm. This, of course, fails horribly. But how can I make it pass? Well, I won't be quite so bold as before and claim that this was a hacky mess. Maybe there is something in here that can be generalized that will pass the three case. And in fact, it's not hard to find. I can take that while loop right there and I can copy it. And once I copy it, I can take all the twos and turn them into threes. This will divide through by all the threes. That passes the nine case, but it violates a rule. What's the rule that it violates? No duplicate code. The dry principle has been violated. I put duplicate code in here. I duplicated that thing. I can't do that. I must now, since I have green, I must now refactor. And to refactor this, I'm going to have to take that entire wad of code and put it into another loop. What loop? Well, the two obviously has to be replaced with a variable. So allow me to do that first. All three occurrences, please. Yes, I will call that divisor. I will take the divisor up outside of the if statement. I will transform the if statement into a while loop. There it is again. And notice now the while loop has a very interesting significance. I'm going to be dividing through until I get a one. Huh. Oh, I better increment that divisor. Pass or fail. Damned interesting. Damned interesting. And now, something odd has happened. This loop cannot terminate until n is 1, which means this if statement is no longer relevant. It really was the terminating loop condition. I don't need it there anymore. And now I can do a little bit of interesting cleanup. For example, I can take this while, and I can make it a for loop. And uh, that means I should be able to take that incrementer there, which is not actually an incrementer, but we'll call it one. And I should be able to um, put it there. That should still work, of course. Uh, no, it won't, because I did something stupid. And my undo doesn't work. Uh, uh, oh, and the stupid thing I did was that. Good. Lovely. Um, I don't like braces. There was a time when I liked braces, but I don't like them anymore. Because I like my while loops to have as few lines in them as possible. Uh, and I don't want to protect you from, if you want to add to my loops, you put your own damn braces in. Uh, let's see. I think I can take this while loop, turn that into a for loop. I can take that initializer and I can stick it right in there. And I can take this incrementer, and I can put it right in there. I think that will continue to work. Oh, no, I've done something horrible again. And what is it this time? I, I think I deleted something horrible. Let me see what it was. Yeah, the stuff that adds stuff to the list. I'm actually going back in time to where I was. Oh, goodness. All right. That for loop is there. Let's put this for loop in. Let's put this initializer in there. Let's take this incrementer and put it in there. Let's take those braces out of here. I think it's probably when I put pulled the braces out. There we go. That's an interesting algorithm. Is it going to work? 
Hmm. Well, let's write another test. Uh, cert equals as list um, 2 comma 2 comma 3 comma 3 comma 5 comma 7 comma 11 comma 13. Of 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 11 times 13. Yeah, I think that algorithm works. Now, what you saw there was something very weird. At what point did I sit down and figure out this algorithm? I just kind of developed it into place. Why does it work? Notice that the algorithm makes no mention whatever of prime numbers. If I were to ask you to come up with an algorithm that computes the prime factors of an integer, you might think, oh, I need a list of prime numbers, and then I'll divide through by all those prime numbers and figure out which ones are factors of the number. Uh, that's not what happened here. Why does this even work? Well, if you look at it for a minute, you'll realize why it works. It works because all composite numbers are larger than their component primes. And therefore, I will have divided through by all the primes before I ever get to a composite number. When I get to 6, I've already taken out 2 and 3. So this does, in fact, find all prime numbers. It just does so by a strange quirk. And I didn't think through that strange quirk. I didn't understand it. It just kind of happened. This may make you very nervous. This may make you think, well, he didn't think through his algorithm. But I beg to differ with you. I did think through the algorithm. I just thought through it in a different way. I thought through it in one little step at a time. One little step at a time where every step was validated by executing code. And I landed at an algorithm that works quite nicely. In fact, this is about the best algorithm you can get. Oh, there's one little tweak I can do to it. I can change n to the square root of n and uh, cut the search time down quite a bit. But other than that, I've got about the best algorithm there is. So. How is it that I managed to derive an algorithm through this strange process of writing little tests and making them pass? Does this always work? Five forty, what is it now? Six twenty? Six twenty five? We have about fifteen minutes. Do I have that right? I'm gonna have to speed this one up a little bit. So how is it that we can derive these algorithms? Does it always work that way? So let's employ a little thought experiment, you and I. Let's suppose that we were going to write a sort algorithm. What would the first test case be? Now, one of the rules of test-driven development is that the very first test case must be the most degenerate condition you test. Sort an empty list, thank you. So how do you pass that test? What is it you return if you're sorting an empty list? You return the empty list. Ah, we're going to return a constant. Interesting. All right, the next test case. The next test case is an array with one integer in it. What must you return to make that one pass? Yes, the input. We are going to transform the empty list that we returned at first into a variable, which happens to have been passed into us, taking that constant, the empty list, and transforming it into something more general, the input list. The next test, two elements in order, pass or fail? Pass. We're doing good. Next test case, two elements out of order, fails. What must we do? We could put an if statement in, and what would that if statement do? Compared to the first and the second, and if they're out of order, Switch them. The two components of every sort algorithm, compare and swap. Ah, passes. 
Next input, three elements in order. Pass or fail? Pass. Next test case, three elements, first two out of order. Pass or fail? Pass. Next test case, three elements, second two out of order. Fail. But what can we do to make it pass? We know how to swap the first two elements. We can just increment the index and swap the second two elements. We have to put that compare and swap into a loop. Okay? Passes. Next test case. Elements in reverse order. Three elements in reverse order. Fails. Why does it fail? It swaps the first two, it swaps the second two, but the first two are out of order again. Oh, we've got to go back and swap the first two again. We have to put that loop into another loop. What have we invented? Bubble sort. Worst possible sort algorithm. This is not a good omen. Maybe this test-driven development stuff is good at making stuff work, but not good at figuring out reasonable algorithms. However... There was a decision we made early on. Two elements out of order. We made a decision to compare and swap them. There was another thing we could have done. Instead of comparing them and swap them, we could have compared them all right, but then returned a different array, loaded in a different order, not swapping them, just New arrays, entirely new arrays, in the correct order. We would not have been using any assignment statements. We would not have changed the state of the input array. We would have, in fact, returned a different array, leaving the input array untouched. And it's very interesting, and I will leave this as an experiment for you to do at home. When you make that decision, you wind up with a quicksort, and it almost falls out inevitably you wind up with a quicksort, the best of all algorithms. So that's a very interesting thing. Is it possible that when you come to a decision point while you're doing test-driven development, is it possible that there are certain decisions that lead to good algorithms and other decisions that lead to bad algorithms? And here comes the premise part. I do this as a workshop, and this is all the workshop stuff. Here's the list of transformations. What's a transformation? Well, before I answer that, what's a refactoring? What is a refactoring? A refactoring is an operation you can perform on code that changes its structure but does not change its behavior. When we refactor, we change the structure of the code, but we leave the behavior intact as measured by the tests. When you transform, you change the behavior of the code. These transformations are small changes, each one of which changes the behavior of the code. You could look at test-driven development as swapping between these two modes. First, we write a test. Then we make it pass by applying transformations. Then we clean up the code using refactorings. Write another test, transform to make it work, refactor to make it clean. Write another test, transform to make it work, refactor to make it clean. We go around that loop. And the, the transformations are very simple. You've seen a number of them. Take uh, no code at all. That's what this empty brace means. No code at all and turn it into a nil. In fact, you've seen that a few times as well. I uh, started out with a null in the prime factors in the prime factors example. The next transformation is take a null and turn it into a constant. You saw that as well. I took the null in prime factors and I turned it into an empty array, an empty list. Another transformation, take a constant and turn it into some kind of variable. Well, we saw that also in the prime factors example when we took the 2 and we turned it into n constant to variable. Uh, statement to if. Well, we saw that several times in prime factors where I inserted a split in the control flow. I took a statement that had fallen through before and I split it into a different control flow and did something like uh, divide by two. 
transform a scalar into a vector. This happens frequently in lots of applications where you have a single element and then you realize you need an array and you transform the scalar element into a plural element or an array. There are several others here. You saw this one, if to while. Notice what's way down here at the bottom. Stateless to assignment. The premise is this. If you come to a decision point in your testing, there's two ways to transform the code to make it work. Compare and swap or compare and return two new arrays. Choose the one that's higher on this list. Assignment is the swap. We don't want to do that one. So we'll have to do some kind of constant or perhaps a, a vector, a scalar. We'll have to create a new one and do it that way. And maybe if we do that, we will wind up with better algorithms. The premise, as it sits before you, is that given this list and given that you hit a decision point while you are doing test-driven development, will you get better algorithms in every case if you choose a transformation that is higher on the list? Are there any questions? About any of that? <laughs> or about the Crab Nebula? So there is a blog site, uh, my blog site, uh, blog.cleancoders.com or something like that. Um, you can find it, and there are several examples there. There's an example of a word wrap al algorithm. There's the sort example. There's a bunch of other examples. There have been a, a number of folks that have tried this at code retreats and code camps, attempting to see if, if this actually works for them. It's interesting. Maybe it does. Maybe test-driven development is a way not only to derive good algorithms or workable algorithms, but maybe it's a way to derive good algorithms if you follow those priorities. We pride ourselves, we programmers, on how smart we are. We think, I can figure out that algorithm. I'm going to just code it until I can get that mother to work. And when we do that, we abandon something that has been drilled into us for most of our lives. That everything we do well, we do incrementally. Everything we do, do well, we do in tiny little steps. Our teachers in grade school try and teach us this. They say, don't write a story all at once, boys and girls. Write an outline, write a rough draft, repeat it over and over. They try to teach us that the things that are worth doing we do in tiny little steps. And then we become professional programmers and something grabs us in our gut and says, I can just write the whole thing at once. No, you can't. And it's a good idea that I think you face that. Maybe it would be wise if we adopted an incremental approach to deriving our algorithms and to writing our code. Thank you for your attention. I will let you go. If there anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'll be up here packing up. Thanks very much.